after initially considering withdrawing like many of my peers, uh, I decided that this would probably end up being the new norm if people didn't at least try to challenge it. So I was intent with returning to campus with the full expectation that I would be removed or reprimanded at some point, but not to the extent that I received, at least not the the large support I've received from my media coverage of my story. Okay, so to start off, would you mind telling us a little bit about yourself? So your age, the university you're attending, the program, and just like what's important for us to know about you? So um, what's important to know about me is that I moved to Canada when I was 10 with my immediate family. Uh, I went to school uh, here in London, Ontario, and I qualified for engineering at UWO in 2018, uh, where I was in a first year uh, engineering undergrad uh, program. And after first year, I qualified for chemical biomedical engineering uh, in 2019. And then in 2020, as I experienced the online classes and mandates and uh, people writing their exams at home uh, collaboratively and what was supposed to be a collaborative, uh, a competitive program, uh, I was no longer content with the program and decided to withdraw and didn't return for the online year and only returned in uh this year, or last year, I should say, in 2021, uh, for civil engineering, because I wasn't, I was uh, woefully disappointed with the trajectory that our country was on. And since then, I've been involved with uh, fighting off my charges in my four legal cases that are going on right now, and being involved with student groups uh, here in Ontario and other interest groups that want to help me out and elevate my status and platform for other students. Perfect. Um, so you've been arrested four times, to my understanding. Can you kind of walk us through, <laughs> that's a lot of times, sure. for something like this. Uh, can you walk us through each one and sort of what happened, what led up to that? Um, just kind of give us the, the full story if you can. So what led to my arrest was within a few days in mid-August after paying the first installment of my tuition, they announced that all students, not just those in residence, but also those living off campus, would uh, require to disclose their vaccination status. And if they were not vaccinated or did not have a valid exemption uh, by a certain date, they would be de-enrolled and uh, trespassed against campus activities. So uh, after initially considering withdrawing like many of my peers, uh, I decided that this would probably end up being the new norm if people didn't at least try to challenge it. So I was intent we're returning to campus with the full expectation that I would be removed or reprimanded at some point, but not to the extent that I received, at least not the, the large support I've received from my media coverage of my story. But the way that unfolded was uh, for several weeks, all throughout September, I was receiving we uh, routine emails, threats about my presence on campus and not disclosing my status and needed to providing proof by a certain date. And then finally, on October 13th, they said that I was trespassed against the campus and I was no longer allowed to attend the campus. And I had uh, two weeks to acknowledge this and perhaps remedy it by providing my vaccination status. Uh, all throughout this, I didn't provide any correspondence to the university whatsoever, uh, nor to the ombuds person, because I made the assumption that um, they weren't going to uh, reconcile or reconsider and I just wasn't willing to recognize the authority of the institution that would be willing to implement these measures and go so far as to exclude and discriminate discriminate against students in such a way but even after they issued the trespass on October 12th I was still attending my class I was still able to attend and do my tests assignments quizzes even midterms all the way until late October just before um, reading week, uh, they finally removed my student access, my online student access. So that really prevented me from being able to study, uh, to continue submitting assignments and following along with my course content and maintaining contact and announcements with my professors. So uh, after reading week, I reached out to a professor that based on his conduct within the class during those two months uh, had gained the respect of students like myself 
for being lenient and sympathetic towards uh, people that are dissatisfied with the university experience at this point. And I asked him after identifying myself, he immediately recognized me because he, as he told me shortly afterwards, that he had received specific instructions from the email regarding my presence in the classroom. And that if he was aware of my presence in the classroom, he should take steps to have me removed by campus police. But he didn't do that, obviously. And I'm grateful to that, which is why I haven't identified him. And um, because of that, uh, he gave me that insight and it really left me with no other option than to ask the students in my classroom whether or not they thought this was acceptable. So after that date, uh, I stopped wearing the mask. Uh, obviously, I am someone that's very adamant about all of this and I'm very unhappy whenever I'm wearing a mask, which is why I was more than uh, happy making that sacrifice and giving up my placement in academia because it just wasn't worthwhile to me. And I would ask students what makes student and university life worthwhile to them because I don't think it's about education for them anymore. I definitely don't think it's about them wearing masks in a classroom that they've had to uh, be vaccinated for. I think most students are more or less just content enjoying the social and partying aspect of university of those who still remain in those institutions. Anyway, before I get too sidetracked. Um, so the very next day after talking to my professor, I went to class without a mask. And all throughout that day, uh, not a single professor, not a single student, not a single TA even acknowledged it. Because you can imagine there's so much fear and hesitation in that class that when someone makes a bold decision like I did, they don't even know how to react. And you're going to see more of that when you look at the videos of my arrest, the, the lack of a, a reaction, the complete apathy of the students that claim to sympathize with my cause. I had made friends in that classroom and I was making them well aware of what was happening to me and what they should expect and what I was planning to do. And they had given me their assurance and their support and confidence that they would uh, stand up in the room on that day and they would prevent this from happening or at least they would make their voices heard and they would express their discontent and uh, who can say because we've only seen one perspective of my arrest and there were people in there that um, I know were recording different perspectives and were saying things in support of me but those people have never come forward they've never reached out to me and uh their videos or whatever recordings they captured have never surfaced. And I don't know if they've been compelled by their peers because of that kind of social pressure or because they've been remanded by the university, as I was told by the special constables in my detainment afterwards, that uh, any students that were willing to collaborate me or aid me in attending my classes, as they did, uh, I'll elaborate later on, they, they would face similar consequences for assisting someone like me in attending campus. So uh, I've received very little support from my own classroom, unfortunately. But that was just the first arrest. And that, that was on Thursday, November 11th, uh, which was Remembrance Day. That's, that's the arrest that really got uh, people's attention. And that was my intention because I wanted the students to know this. And it didn't matter to me whether or not the city or the province or the country at large would hear my story. I really just wanted to know that the students that I worked alongside, students that I did schoolwork with, I worked on projects on, and we did assignments together with our names all undersigned together, worked in close proximity to each other without our masks. They knew I was unvaccinated. I told them in confidence. And then after all of this, uh, they just decided to remove me from the uh, online chats that we were using to discuss our assignments. So whether or not they uh, supported me then, uh, it's clear to me now that I didn't have their full support and I didn't have their complete honesty and trust on that issue. But that was just the arrest that was publicized because that was actually the second arrest. The first arrest uh, happened outside the classroom where nobody saw it. And I, that was very deliberate of the university because the day after I stopped wearing my mask, even though nobody knowledge, acknowledged it at the time, somebody took notice and somebody uh, wasn't going to tolerate this, especially they weren't going to tolerate a student signaling to other students in the classroom that a mask is really not necessary for your personal protection. And it should be a personal decision whether or not you think you need that kind of protection. 
especially for someone that has undergone the medical procedure and has received their second or third booster up until now. But they weren't going to tolerate that. So the day after I stopped wearing a mask, uh, several weeks after I'd been trespassed against property, finally did they post special constables outside my classroom. And after ordering me to leave the campus, I told them I refused, that I paid to be here, and it is my responsibility to attend my classes. They said they're going to have to arrest me. And I said, so be it. And they arrested me on the spot, and uh, they searched me, they frisked me, and they held me in the back of their squad car, uh, returned me to their office in the center of campus, and I had a lovely discussion with a very sympathetic uh, special constable who was very reluctant to issue a trespass ticket which is being resolved during this week. Uh, I can't say much more about it than that. But what I can say is uh, during that detainment, uh, you could see the indecision, you could see the doubt, you could see the internal conflict of that special constable, or of at least that special constable. And I would hope uh, a long way down the road, perhaps he would come forward and share his experience. But that wasn't going to be something that was universal, unfortunately. So. Uh, the day after that, um, I made sure that my classes wasn't guarded. And uh, by asking one of the trusted students that was still had uh, supported me at the time, whether or not it was safe for me to enter the class. And after getting the all clear, I made my way into the class. Uh, I didn't bring my school bags. I knew I was going to get arrested. And I was very concerned about um, what measures the university would take to uh, use my personal possessions against me. So I went to class without a mask, without a backpack, as would be my preference. And uh, right away, uh, the professor who I knew I had the full expectation that he wasn't going to tolerate it based on the rhetoric he was espousing in the classroom during the two months I was in his class. Uh, but instead of being a, a reprimand on the spot, instead of trying to negotiate with me and acknowledge it, he just quietly said to himself and to the classroom that he needs to make a phone call outside the classroom. So he stepped out, he made his phone call. And I looked around because it was known to some of the students and it should have been obvious to them what was going on. And to my surprise, I would say at least a third of them took their masks off. And I really thought in that moment that this might finally be it. This might be the opportunity for students to finally voice their concern and their dissatisfaction and stand in solidarity with a fellow student who was willing to take that stand for them. But unfortunately, uh, as soon as the professor re-entered the class, the masks came back on. And it just goes to show that students aren't really wearing the mask for their own sake. They're doing it because of the social pressures and the expectations of their peers, of their professors, and of the institution. And the professor was allowed to carry on the class undisturbed. And then after 20 minutes, the professor had to step out again. And he politely asked me to step out of the class to deal with the special constables. But that wasn't the plan. I was very insistent that the special constables conduct their business in front of the classroom. and. The same uh, special constable that issued the trespass ticket the day before came in, told me that I can't be here, I'm trespassing. And I said, why am I trespassing? And he said, I'm not going to discuss this here with you in front of class. So if you're not going to leave, then I'm going to have to arrest you on the spot. And I said, fine. And that's when you see me stand up in the video and he handcuffs me and they remove me from the classroom. And that was on a Thursday. And I had planned on returning to class uh, the next day in the very same class. Uh, but I was told by my peers that the class was guarded. So I went home. And then over the weekend, I saw my video circulating on Instagram. But I had no idea how far uh, that story was going to go in terms of uh, in other social media platforms where I've heard that it reached a million views or so before being taken down and it got the attention of the mainstream media and uh, they were the first to reach out to me uh, not long after that and after my what would be third arrest. Uh, I hadn't intended on being a public figure. I thought my story would just more or less demonstrate how most students really feel and I thought there would really be 
uh, a universal message, a universal outcry, not only for my uh, suffering in this ordeal, but for their own. But a lot of people were just more or less concerned with me and who I was and what kind of person I was and my own personal celebrity. And I am the least qualified. I am not that kind of person. I'm a very private person. I've had to start uh, establish a presence on a lot of these social media platforms just to give students and other people concerned an avenue to communicate with me if they want. Because that's all I was, I've always offered. That's all I was really willing to offer is just dialogue and discussion about these issues. So uh, it was after my second, well, my second video to rest, but my third real arrest when I returned to class the following Monday. And the only difference being was that it was the same room, but it was a different professor. And I really didn't know what to expect from this professor. And I would suspect that if he was the first professor that um, had to consider calling campus police to have me arrested, uh, there may have been a different outcome. But I think precedent was established. And because one uh, brazen professor decided that this was an acceptable course of action, he decided that as soon as I entered the room, that day I did bring my bag because I really didn't know. And I was again maskless. And before he did anything, he said to me quietly, like, I guess I have to call the police now. And I said, if you have to. And he more or less just did the same thing as the first professor, stepping out of the classroom, making his phone call. And again, I just looked around at the classroom and just asking them with my eyes, with my actions, uh, what they feel how they feel about this, what they think about it. And um, it was only the person that sat directly next to me that um, seemed completely ignorant of the situation because he thought it was just a mask issue. So he offered me a mask and I said, that won't help. That's not what this is about. Um, and uh, I'm sure a discussion, uh, he wanted to lead me into a discussion about why I'm doing this and it really wasn't the place for it. Uh, I really could have used my stance to uh, make express a message to those people, but uh, you could say actions speak louder than words and the video speaks for itself. And there's a million different things I could have said, but I've been saying millions of things long before all this, all throughout these two years and nobody has seemed to listen. So that didn't seem like the time to speak out and say what I felt and why I was doing this. I guess it was more or less down to the students to witness it for themselves and decide for themselves what this really means to them instead of having me try and help them decide that for themselves. But in that arrest, uh, the these were different special constables and they had been given the impression that I would cooperate because of my conduct with uh, the special constables and the two prior arrests. But um, what, what really aggravated me was that they weren't willing to handcuff me. And the decision making behind that, as I was illuminated afterwards by these special constables, is that uh, handcuffing is at their discretion and they only feel compelled to do so if I'm perceived as a threat to public safety. Now, the obvious irony is that the whole point of me being uh, suspended, trespassed, and expelled, expelled from the campus is that because the university believes I'm a public safety. They believe I'm a vector for disease and they think that I have the potential to spread a virus to them and that includes contact. But the special constables uh, decided for themselves perhaps that the handcuffs weren't necessary or what is probably more likely the case it's bad PR and it makes the university look bad. And even when they're arresting a student for being present in a class that they've been trespassed against, they won't even use their own logic. And they, they decided not to handcuff me, uh, uh, at which point I said, well, I'm not going to be perceived as complicit in the event that this arrest is going to be recorded as well, which it was. Uh, but it hasn't received as much traction because it's not as long and you don't clearly see who I am. But in that video, you can see I'm carried out by my arms and legs because I refuse to walk out. Because if I'm not being arrested, then I don't understand 
why I'm being trespassed and detained and suspended and eventually expelled. Um, I think it was after that third arrest. Um, the special constables, after detaining me and taking me back to their office, we talked at length about what I was doing because clearly a pattern was formulating for them and they wanted to try and understand my long-term goal and objective here. So we talked at length about what I'm trying to do, uh, which I've hopefully given you an indication of. And um, once they had everything they thought they needed from me or I was willing to give them, uh, they released me on the edge of property, just like in all the other previous arrests. Uh, but this time, uh, they used what I had disclosed to them against me in justifying my expulsion that came shortly after that third arrest. Uh, so I was expelled. And I, I'm i surprised. Uh, but hindsight is twenty twenty, so I'm not surprised. I think if my story didn't get the traction it was uh, getting, then I would still be going to class today and I would be pursuing this to its conclusion. And I would want to know. That was my intention at the outset. I wanted to know how far this community was willing to tolerate uh, these kind of mandates and how far the institution was willing to punish those that don't abide by them. And I would have been willing to sit in a jail cell to find out, to know what they were willing to do. Because at this point, uh, I feel like I am living in a jail cell and every freedom I enjoy now, my limited freedoms I'm permitted to enjoy right now, um, I can exercise in a jail cell. So that's what was my intention. However, I had to humble myself and had to appreciate that my stance and my story um, was a common one. And I have to share the burden and the responsibility of uh of those students that are sharing in my suffering. So I want the best outcome for them. So uh, I went public because other people from my for former life, from past experience, uh, started to recognize me in the video. So it was only a matter of time and somebody was handing my, circulating my phone number. So I started responding to some of the people that were looking for me and that's when I got in touch with some of these student groups and um, one of them uh, wanted to carry on with my intentions. So uh, the that led to my last arrest, which happened a few weeks after the string of free arrests. So off the top of my head, the first arrest was November 10th. The second was November 11th. And then the third arrest was November 15th. And then um, I start, I went public and I, uh, consolidated and I met some people and we considered how we could continue this and go forward. So we decided with one of these student groups that we would get a cameraman and we would return to campus on December 2nd because uh, one of the things that stuck out from the media coverage that I received shortly after my first string of arrest was uh, uh, one of the interviews done by CTV News and they singled out these two female engineering students who expressed their gratitude and their pleasure at having me removed from campus and that they felt much safer. And I know that wasn't the consensus of my classroom. And I, I imagine that they had to ask a lot of students the same question before they found that very isolated, very extreme perspective on campus. So my intention was to return to campus and get everyone's perspective, not just the isolated and extreme and radical opinions of those that think I should be removed from campus. So we got a cameraman and in a very open forum outside in the middle of campus, uh, I invited a large group of students at UWO who had their sympathies and support for me to come out and express their views and hopefully draw a crowd and get everyone's opinions, not just people that are that support me uh, and on side in these issues, but also people on the opposite side, because we, we really want to try and understand and really expose their logic at this point. And I think we, people need to acknowledge how ugly this kind of discourse has become. And we want to see the kind of extreme radical opinions that allow this and permit and permeate this kind of culture on campus. But unfortunately, within 20 minutes of beginning the interview, uh, campus police uh, were made aware right away and they uh, arrested me on the spot. 
Uh, there's a lot of things that were different about this arrest. But before I go on, what we learned in the aftermath is that in one of these large student groups of UWO students, of 200 or so students, I believe, uh, it was learned that there was an informant inside the group. So that's how they knew we were planning this event, that I was returning to campus. And a lot of students uh, got in trouble for things said in this private uh, group chat. So that's really unfortunate. And there's a lot that can be said about that. But what I want to say about it right now is that this shouldn't be an indication for people to go underground and stop voicing their concerns. It should be a sign of how detrimental and how extreme things have become that people are being incentivized to infiltrate and extract this knowledge from people like us about how we're collaborating, what we're trying to accomplish. So it's something to consider. Anyway, during that arrest, uh, there was very little sympathy and tolerance. Uh, what made this arrest different from all the others is that very deliberate attempt to be aggressive and intimidate me. And um, it had its own personal effect, but this isn't about uh, police brutality or my uh, personal grievance with the university. It's more or less a cultural and institutional uh, development in recent years that institutions are willing to direct their special constables a branch of the police that are meant to serve and protect the students on campus to uphold public student safety on these premises. And they've been directed to uh, hold me in handcuffs throughout my interrogation, uh, to frisk me aggressively behind closed doors, and to drag me on the ground and be reluctant to handcuff me. And I tell them, if you don't handcuff me, you're going to drag me. And that, in his frustration, he put on his handcuffs uh, much more tightly than I experienced previously. So the message was clear, and these special constables um, did that. And these weren't the same constables that arrested me previously. This was a different kind of constable, and on a different day. And maybe this was his personal belief. Maybe he was taking out his own personal frustration and grievance. Uh, what I was doing, but it's my belief that this was intentional because while I was held in, the, in their custody, in handcuffs, with all my clothes disheveled, I could hear the conversations going on outside about what they could do to remove me and extradite me. And I heard them discuss whether or not I was an international student. Uh, they were very hopeful that if I was an international student, that they could possibly extradite me or have my student visa revoked or whatever course of action that would, would have led to, as I imagine a lot of students are trapped in right now. So, yeah, uh, you could see how far the special constables were willing to go to have me removed and not just the special constables, but the university admins and at the at their direction, what they were willing to do to have me removed. So. Uh, that led to a criminal charge, actually, in my fourth arrest. The first arrests were just uh, civil violations. But this was a criminal charge. This was criminal mischief. And I signed an agreement that I wouldn't return to campus until this charge was resolved. And um, I can't say much more than that, but it just shows that uh, step by step, they slowly escalate. And it's not just in my case, but they're doing it all over. With everything else, they've escalated the restrictions on people that don't abide by the mandates. They've escalated the the expectations on people that abide by them. And they've escalated um, the medical requirements, being that you have a third booster. And there's already rhetoric about whatever new measures they want to impose in the near future or the far future, depending on how long people are willing to tolerate it. But yeah, that, that was the full extent of my four arrests. It's incredible. I saw two videos. I saw one where, and now that I've heard your story, I believe that would have been the second one where you were in the classroom and you can hear in the background students laughing. And you were saying there would have been about a third of the students who actually did support you and had taken off their masks. Is that right? That that's that video that I saw was the second arrest? That was the second arrest. That was the first video. And what I was saying, like, yeah, I heard them laughing. I've seen a lot of people laughing and mocking online. Um, but I don't think, uh, I don't believe that when the professor stepped out to make that phone call, 
uh, people weren't taking off their masks because they recognized the situation and wanted to express their support for me. They did it because that was their personal decision. But what kind of generation are we raising where people don't make personal decisions but for themselves when they're uh, under the observance of authority figures like their professors? And when you when you give up that freedom, it's it's a very dangerous precedent. And those people will laugh at me. And I've spoken to some of my former peers, not not from that classroom, but from uh, when I was first in engineering in my first and second year in 2018 through to 2020. Um, one of the things that stuck out to me was what uh, my former student said, which was, um, you made a decision for yourself, and I am happy for you for that. And what I made a point of clarifying was that, um, sorry, let me correct that. You're going to have to edit this. <laughs> no She's, my former friend said, um, you made a different decision from everyone else. And I am happy for you for that. And I was quick to correct her and saying, no, no, you and everyone else have made a different decision from me. And I am not happy for you. And I'm actually very sad for you. But I am more or less advocating for the things we used to enjoy, which was real classrooms with real professors that cared and not just online learning from video lectures from years ago from professors that have taken a leave of absence because this is not what they agreed to either. A lot of professors aren't content about it. And you see a lot of uh, professors that aren't qualified that have to fill these positions and a lot of students that have to fill uh, these positions that aren't qualified because enrollment would be low and they've got to fill these spots as they restrict and exclude more and more students. Yeah, what I'm even um, realizing is people are not seeing the bigger picture or why a lot of people are choosing to take stands like you are. They're more pro-choice than anti-vax, if anything. Um, but something I found interesting that that you said in another interview, I think that was with Kate Wand, um, excellent interview. You said that there were a lot of different empty classrooms at Western where students would congregate or spend time together and they would take off their masks and openly talk about what was going on. Can you speak or speak more to that or explain sort of what was going on there or how many students did agree with you? You were saying the one third were really doing it for their own personal, not personal choice, not um not to show solidarity or support with you. How many students would you say really did openly like agree with you or, or feel the same way as like, like agreed with what you're doing? Well, how many students did really support me? How many people are hiding on campus right now? And how many people do I really believe did support me? Um, I mean, that's impossible to know because mm -hmm. I don't think for them, but if you want to define it as people that said to me, uh, personally that they don't believe that they would go so far as to remove me from classmen have me arrested and suspended and that they would support me if they did and they wouldn't let it happen um that was at least 10 students in that room uh, those were students that i worked on projects with uh, and their friends that i got to know and i was talking to them in the classrooms about this before class would start, before the professor would enter the room, I would tell them, like, yeah, look, this is the email I've got. This is what's going to happen. And they would all say, wow, I can't believe it. Well, we won't let that happen and we support you completely. So there's at least 10 students that said they were going to support me. But uh, as many as a third, which is nearly 50 students in the classroom, took off their masks when the professor stepped out. Um, I, I definitely didn't have all of their support because if I did, I imagine we'd be in a very different world right now. Um, but they were just doing that as a personal preference. But speaking to uh, students that are essentially going underground, and uh, I've had this, I had this discussion earlier today about like we need to form these speakeasies, so to speak, like because there is no safe space, so to speak, uh, for students to study at their own leisure. They're always under the observance of like these building ambassadors. Any university student right now knows what that's like. 
buildings that are plastered with stickers about which doors are exits and entrances, which directions you're supposed to walk, and uh, how many people can sit at this table, and how many people and uh, wearing a mask, obviously. And they have people patrolling uh, these buildings all the time. So on day one, I had to figure out uh, where I could study at my own leisure. And I didn't have to live under these kinds of restrictions. And there was a building in the center of campus uh, adjacent to a construction site that had been designated uh, not for use for students, but it was a totally empty classroom and it was never used. And I was familiar with it because that's where I did most of my studying throughout my first and second year. So that's where I did my study. So when I wasn't in class where I was forced to wear a mask, I walked all the way to this building and I studied in there. And that was the, just the one place I used uh, most of the time. But over time, I invited one of my friends to join me there. He, he was grateful for it. And I saw other students from other engineering years uh, stepping into that classroom periodically. So who knows how many students were using that room because obviously I wasn't there all the time. And that was just one of the rooms that I was using. Who knows how many other rooms were being used for this purpose? There was actually a second classroom that I used as well because it was adjacent to another proximate class of mine. But this was in the building and it was just it was just a convenience of the scheduling. So uh, between some of the classes, yeah, you find empty classrooms. And don't be surprised when you find them with a couple of students in them not wearing their masks because that's exactly what they're using them for. And that's essentially all, all I'm trying to build uh, for students going forward just creating a space where uh, they could educate themselves or continue to participate uh, in these institutions if they're willing, but in their own comfort. And that doesn't mean studying online at home. That's not what that means. Like we, we pay an exorbitant price for this education for a reason. And uh, the fact that the, the student experience is their reputations going down the toilet and uh, you could hope that might hurt uh, enrollment and the uh, bottom line, but uh, it's all too easy to speculate that they can bankroll these measures from the politicians and big pharma that expect it of them. So, yeah. I know that you said you didn't necessarily want to be a leader in this and that, you know, you, but you're, you're doing your part. What sets you apart? What has given you the courage to do what you're doing? <laughs> Well, speaking honestly, what gave me the courage to do this? Um, I don't think it takes much courage for people to decide to live the lives they want to, right? And I think for the majority of people, it's either they don't value their expectations from life or um, they just, they value other things more. Like one of my former high school acquaintances, uh, he mocks me and says, you know, that I'm a crazy conspiracy theorist and that I'm overly skeptical of gov government control, even though he is someone that uh, values his stance as someone that's right wing and hates government control and mandates and all that stuff. But he's convinced himself, he sold himself on the idea that um, this vaccine is ethical and it's necessary. And it's our only way out of this. But uh, as the situation develops, that discussion evolves. So he mocked me then. But then a few weeks later, he's expected to get a third booster. And he's online and stuck at home and not allowed to enjoy the things Canadians used to enjoy, just like me. And he can decide for himself whether or not he's uh, sold himself or oversold himself on this idea of uh, this being the only way to recover from this situation or you can reconcile and realize that perhaps this is not the way forward and that we're just being sold on false promises and it's really up to Canadians to decide for themselves when enough is enough so uh, he's very unhappy about that but how often do those discussions get to happen but he justifies his decisions by saying that he likes to socialize he likes to go out and drink and eat and party and all those things that students enjoy and expect from their university experience but I think they've forgotten why these institutions were built to begin with which was their education and 
clearly they don't value their education as much as the social aspect of university, which is fine to each their own, but it really creates this false impression that there's a large majority of people that actually think uh, the vaccines and the masking and the social distancing and the isolation and the closing of businesses and other amenities we enjoy um, are being supported by these students. They're not. And we didn't even give them an opportunity uh, to voice their concern and to ask whether or not they believe that this was a logical or reasonable expectation on them. But students don't students don't ask themselves that anymore. I think they just more or less prioritize the few luxuries they're afforded now. And if that means getting their third booster, that's what they're willing to do. Luckily for me, I am the kind of person that doesn't value those things. And I'm a very private person. And I was there to get educated. And you can see a lot of people think I am very well-educated and well-spoken. And perhaps that's why, because you're not going to find the kind of student that enjoys partying to take these risks because they still get to enjoy the things that don't matter. Whereas I no longer enjoyed the things that mattered to me because I knew I was getting a subpar education and I was paying way too much for it. And a daily, on a daily uh, regularly on a daily basis, I was looking around totally dissatisfied with the culture on campus. And I could enumerate all the disputes I've gotten into over these last two years about these issues. Um, just for example, when I was waiting outside a classroom for my professor to arrive, like I said, I only wore a mask in class, but between classes, as soon as I walked out that door, mask was off. And when I was waiting outside classes, one female student in my classroom said, uh, could you wear your mask, please? And I said, why? And I said, uh, it's the law. And I said, it's not the law. But people don't realize that. And a lot of people don't realize it's not law. And it's more or less just a cultural pressure and expectation that's held on them. But those are the things I, I, don't, I don't value. And uh, I got the privilege of meeting Dr. Julie Paness and she gave me her book and in her book she says very happily and openly that she's not the kind of person that cares about what other people think and I think I think that's a virtue we can all aspire to that's certainly what I value I certainly don't uh, value what people think of me but clearly the majority of the student body does may does value that because that's what you see. And if you ask them, honestly, I don't think they value uh, the communal good, the greater good, uh, communal safety and limiting the spread of this virus. They just care about how they're perceived by their peers. And if the majority of people still think it's acceptable and uh, required to wear a mask and get vaccinated and all those other expectations, that's what they're going to continue doing. But I thought we spent a long time throughout our primary and secondary education insisting not to succumb to peer pressure, not to succumb to the expectations of our peers and to be bold and to act as individuals and think freely and critically. But those are just not the attributes we kind of, we, we inspire in these institutions anymore. But that's what I've always valued. I guess I took their word for it and I carried it forward. And when I demonstrate it, I get removed and barred from these institutions. And that's fine. But because I value those, I value those virtues because I know those are the only kinds of people that are going to make this world a better place. And unfortunately, the only kind of people that are in these institutions that are going to be given these placements in the professional world as they fill their way, filter their way into the workforce, um, these are not the kinds of people that value good ideas. They value profitable ideas. They don't value um, the, the cultural implications of innovations. They just value how much wealth we can extract from the general populace if we embark on these kinds of decisions that undermine civil liberties and freedoms. So your future lawyers and doctors and engineers and epidemiologists, don't expect them to have your interests at heart. 
because those are the only kinds of people that are permitted to enter these institutions. And anyone else that does value those things that I speak for, such as uh, courage and uh, credibility and all those other great things, that's what I value, but no, no longer tolerated. And that those are the kinds of people uh, that are going to be willing to make that stand. It's only me that has received the publicity, but my girlfriend went through that experience and I've spoken to a number of students that have done the exact same thing I have, but you don't hear their stories. And I don't know why. Censorship too. Um, yeah, I was also wondering what sort of response you've received since going viral. Have you gotten a lot of positive feedback? I know you've you've done a lot of interviews like with Rebel News and, and whatnot. What sort of response have you gotten from people? Um, so... Like I said earlier, the kind of response I've gotten from people has been mixed, and it should be mixed. While we live in a free democracy, there should be open discourse about relevant issues, especially this one. And uh, like I said earlier, I'm a private person. I don't value uh, the input from my peers and social expectations. I don't use these social media platforms. I don't have a huge presence. I still don't have a huge presence. A different kind of person could have really taken advantage of this opportunity and used it to elevate their status and to build a platform uh, to enumerate these issues on a regular basis. But we already have plenty of people that do that. I wanted to be the person that um, made decisions for myself that I thought would better the community. And perhaps they have. We are yet to see the full extent of the outcome of my decisions. But uh, my attention was drawn to the media attention I was receiving, and I, I read some of the comments, but um, uh, on a personal level, you kind of have to uh, isolate yourself from those very radical opinions because they're not reflective, they're not representative of people at large. And to to expose myself to that kind of public ridicule uh, would have been very unproductive. Even though I have received a little bit of hate mail, uh, my privacy and my minimal participation online has mostly isolated me from a lot of the uh, uh, retaliation from my re uh, actions, but it's been mostly positive support because we're a small community and they've valued what I've done. And I appreciate their recognition. So once uh, my name and story were broadcasted to the mainstream media, I was given the opportunity to talk to more sympathetic media. And that's all I think I'll be collaborating with going forwards. I've received uh, more invitations to talk to mainstream media that I've declined because uh, the story hasn't really changed and it just opens up, uh, it gives them an opportunity to expose me and to put me in vulnerable and compromising positions. And they already have manipulated a lot of the testimony that I've given them in some of the interviews I've given to some of these mainstream outlets. So uh, I'm, I'm glad I got to sp speak to them so I could talk to the majority of Canadians that still value those um, media outlets. But uh, from now on, and maybe in the future, uh, depending on what else I'm involved with and whatever developments in my own personal story unfold, I may have more announcements for uh, mainstream and quote unquote fringe media that people should know because uh, I'd love to give students an indication of what happens to people like me, what happens to people, to the type of people that value their own credibility, their own integrity, their own courage and their own honesty. What happens to people that do those things and demonstrate those things in a public forum like a university. And I hope to have good news for them uh, in the near future. And how can listeners support you? Listeners can support me by supporting themselves because ultimately it is not up to me to change this narrative for you, to change the culture. I am just one person and I'm glad for the impact that I may have had on a certain number of people, but perhaps it's not enough. And it really is up for other people to 
to lead by example and I can lead by example for them. And that's what I've done for a lot of people. A lot of people want to reach out, talk to me, ask me what it takes, what kind of person is required and how much that can help people. When you ask me what you can do to help me, you can start by, you know, making, building a world and a culture where I'm allowed to go to a restaurant again, or a, I can go to a grocery store and I don't have to be uh, concerned about the stares I get from other patrons. And I can go to the mall and see friendly and smiling faces again. And the only way we're going to do that is by leading by example. Now, I don't expect everyone to be arrested like I did. If you want to, great. Because when, when you're talking about bravery and courage, I am much more inclined to uh, get arrested in a classroom than go grocery shopping. Because at least in a classroom, I know I'm going to have their attention. But in a grocery store, it's, you don't get that kind of reaction, as you might expect, as I've expressed because you those people they don't they don't really care they don't really care or value their own integrity or beliefs or thinking anymore they're more than happy to just go along with the narrative they're provided and when you when you decide that's the course of action that you're going to live with for the rest of your life you don't have to be concerned about other people until the media and your governments tell you that you should be concerned about that people it's only these governments, these authorities, these so-called experts that are stoking the division and trying to create a divide and trying to create a scapegoat for ultimately the measures and the medicine that doesn't work and hasn't proven effective in protecting people and has potentially made the situation worse. So you want to help me? Like, just be honest. Just be honest with yourself, please, truly. Like... When you're asked to get a third booster, ask yourself if it's something you really think you need to protect yourself, or is it because you want to maintain your income? And then if it's because you want to maintain your income, then ask yourself, what are you maintaining that income for? Are you doing it because you want to build a better world? You want a better world for the people that you love and hold dear, for your family, your siblings, your friends, and perhaps your children? Uh, ask yourself if this is the kind of world that you want them to inherit. And uh, if you honestly believe that, then we have a long way to go. People like us in trying to tell them that we are still in this two years deep because of people's uh, perhaps ignorant, uh, gullible or naive belief that uh, trusting quote unquote, the science, our authority figures, our so-called experts, is doesn't have any influence on the decisions you personally make for yourself. And in the small interactions, the small insignificant things that you don't think have a larger role to play in our culture, but it does. Every day when you go out and you put on your mask, you're signaling to people that you're concerned for your health and you think there's a public danger. But again, just be honest with yourself and ask, do I think there's a public danger? Do I think I'm a public danger? Most people, I would be willing to bet, don't. So ask yourself what you're really doing this for and whether or not that's you believe in their narrative or you just have to come to terms with the fact that you don't have those virtues that you would like to see in other people. Perhaps you can't understand it. Perhaps you can't think through the motives and the scheme and you're you're scared we're all scared believe me and admit to yourself you're scared but ask yourself again honestly what is driving that fear because the fear is not this virus anymore it's these mandates and the escalation and measures that people really fear and if people start expressing that then perhaps we would go a long way to developing dialogue about what we can do to recover from this situation. That's how you can help me. You can help me by being honest with yourself. So well put, excellent. Uh, Brian, do you have any other questions for Harry? Yes, I do have a good question here. So you not wearing a mask is sort of, I guess, a philosophical statement. Um, and you're bringing to light an issue that's 
um, larger than just not putting on a mask. So you're mentioning about that one student who thought the problem was just you not having a mask. So what is the larger philosophical issue you're bringing to light? And what would you say to someone who thinks, oh, just wear the mask? Like, what's the big deal with that? Mm -hmm. Well, as you've seen, um, there's plenty of science out there that uh, will say certain things about mask wearing. But uh, I'm just an engineer. I'm just a student. I'm not an authority on these issues, but I don't need to be anymore. And that's the truth of it, which is why you don't need to uh, recognize the authority of quote unquote experts. Ultimately, personal health decisions only affect you. And mask wearing has broader implications outside of medicine. And uh, perhaps we've uh, built up a culture of expectations over decades that this may be permissible for a certain group, but not for everyone else regarding our healthcare workers. And perhaps that was incorrect thinking. And someone else can develop a very compelling argument right now, uh, especially by those people that it personally affects. But I am just a regular, ordinary resident of Ontario, and I don't encounter disease and medical emergencies on a regular basis. I doubt uh, most people have, ultimately, if you are willing to look at the real data behind uh, the casualties of this epidemic. But what are the real consequences of decision making that uh, has an influence on your peers? And that's where we get into talks about mask wearing. I think mask wearing is more damning than the vaccine, which is why when people say to me, uh, just wear the mask, it's uh, it has no effect or it's no big deal, like you say. Well, that kind of thinking has led us into, well, continued lockdowns and uh, restrictions because by wearing a mask, you're signaling to everyone else around you that not only you think it's acceptable, but you think there's a credible danger in our midst. And most people probably don't believe that, but they do it. They're wearing the masks because they want access to things, uh, even after they've gone through all the boosters, which may potentially have real implications. But I bet there's a lot of people out there, they say it is no big deal that these vaccines are no big deal. But uh, regardless of the medical implications, like I said earlier, we don't even need to talk about the medicine anymore, even though there's so much information out there that you can find about what these vaccines could potentially be doing to our immune systems and whatever kind of adverse health effects they have. Uh, let's talk about the associated costs of producing and forcing uh, citizens to have these vaccines. Ultimately, uh, we pay for those vaccines. I pay for those vaccines and I don't think they're necessary. But people above me, so-called experts, make that decision for everyone. And we've departed from a culture where people can make medical decisions for themselves. Uh, for example, in uh, September of 2019, before COVID was in the public consciousness, I got really ill. Uh, so I put on a mask. And that's something that everyone should be given the choice to do. And I wouldn't expect everyone else around me to wear a mask just because I was ill. And I wouldn't expect everyone around me to get vaccinated because I was worried about and them spreading disease because I think people forgot and they literally had to cha change the definition of vaccines. Vaccines are supposed to protect you. But uh, this false narrative, this sentiment that uh, not only will this medicine only work if everyone uh, uptakes it, but also uh, all health measures are only effective if we all uptake it. We lead ourselves down a line of reasoning that not only is going to be uh, seriously detrimental to us, as you've seen in other parts of the world, such as Australia, where they have taken the extreme measures and steps to remove people from their homes and to not only restrict everything we've been restricted from, but also a lot of uh, their financial freedoms have been restricted and a lot of the autonomies uh, that we are still allowed with permission to appreciate have been restricted. So... Not only uh, is that a credible danger for people like us, but 
you establish a precedent for the opposition, which is that we need to impose restrictions on people that make reckless health decisions for themselves. And um, without falling into a tangent about how most of the associated deaths from this pandemic have had comorbidities, uh, you could argue that anyone with a comorbidity is a detriment to public health and we should impose restrictions on them. And that means uh, all the things that everyone enjoys, which is alcohol consumption, uh, smoking and eating unhealthy. Are we going to start imposing financial incentives for people that have healthy lifestyles that regularly exercise and meditate and get a good night's sleep and don't drink or smoke or eat poorly? Um, or are we going to punish people that uh, are overweight or uh, are less productive ultimately or contribute less to society because they have limiting health uh, attributes? I know I do. This is a discussion I had uh, long before uh, this pandemic. I am someone with asthma serious asthma, uh, childhood asthma. And at the beginning, I thought I'd be very vulnerable to this uh, respiratory virus, but I've had it twice now. I've been fine, like most people my age, and the statistics reflect that. Uh, but people people don't consider those decisions for themselves anymore because it's not a health decision anymore. That's the reality. It's a cultural and societal decision. And you're not really deciding to uptake these measures for your personal health. It's so you can exercise your freedoms. And the philosophy behind simple decisions such as wearing masks don't enter the domain of science anymore. It's about how much people are willing to lie to themselves or bargain with themselves just so they can enjoy the things that have been taken away from us. Um, that is really the implication here. Um, have you ever felt frightened about speaking out like this or doing anything else you've done? Felt overwhelmed? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you said earlier, um, I, I said I wasn't the kind of person that wanted to take up a leadership role. And do I enjoy speaking out? Um, well, I've been doing it for a long time. So maybe that's why I'm well-practiced at it. And that's why I do such a good job. The only thing that's really adjusted is that there's certain uh, personal things I can't say. And I have to be careful of the mainstream media to not allow, give them the opportunity to manipulate my testimony uh, to put me in a compromising position. But all throughout this pandemic, uh, from previous employment and amongst my own friends, we've been having this dialogue. Uh, everyone should be having this dialogue. <laughs> As long as this goes on, as long as we are in a pandemic, if we are expected to believe that, then people should be talking about this pandemic. But uh, I think a lot of people have had their expectations in life radically shifted and more or less want to avoid the issue and don't want to talk about this pandemic we're living under anymore. Because uh, I think a lot of people are ready to admit that to themselves this is not a temporary measure anymore. This is a new permanent uh, lifestyle that they want to impose on the majority of people. And you, I think we haven't acknowledged that publicly. I think maybe uh, to ourselves, to the majority of people, maybe they would be content with that. But by and large, there would be a, a large minority voice out there that would encourage others to, to fight for the things that they used to enjoy. And they certainly would. And that's all we can give people the opportunity to do by allow them to speak and express their concerns. Um, I've had to, like I said earlier, be humble and be and accept the responsibility and my role in uh, this movement. It is a movement. There's a lot of people. You can't ignore 3 million Canadians and a large percent of people living across the border. You can't ignore that. It is a movement of people. And I have to acknowledge and be humble and in my role. And it's a lot of uh, walking a fine line between uh, what I personally believe and what is going to be best for everyone, including my loved ones going forward. 
at the beginning, I expressed my intent to serve out a jail sentence. And that may have got a lot of traction. It may not have, but I wanted to know. And I wanted the people close to me to know that this is the kind of world we're living in. And we should take steps and measures to prepare ourselves for that in whatever way we can. Um, the public speaking, I, I have to do it. Uh, people want to know. And that's the only thing that's going to help me. I suppose, because we've reached a point where I can't work anywhere. I can't go to school anywhere. All I can do is talk about it. And if I wasn't uh, lucky enough to be given a platform like I have, I would just be having these same discussions with uh, people that are willing to listen. And I was having these discussions long before when I was working in Victoria Hospital here in London. And that's where I got a lot of my practice. And I, I enjoyed those discussions. I, the discussions I value the most are the private ones that I've gotten from all the people and not just on side with the issue with me, but a lot of people from my former life uh, on the opposition. And I've been uh, very grateful that they come forward and they can express their discontent or they can give me their praises, but they're always welcome in my home. And we sit down and we great discourse about these issues and we talk about history we talk about art we talk about literature culture society and those are the things that really matter the most right now at this very moment and that's what i'm going to keep on doing uh but for everyone else uh there i have to keep the message simple because that's life is just so complicated for the majority of people at this point i guess i have uh, the privilege to live comfortably more than most throughout all of this. Not everyone has the luxury to not be able to work and forego their education for the sake of their personal dignity like I have. But a lot of people have to make that personal sacrifice. And I have to, when I get these public speaking engagements and opportunities to uh, speak on a platform like yours, um, try and give an indication and direction to the majority of people about how they live. But that's not necessarily reflective of what I want from life. And uh, yeah. you could see that from the kind of person I was. I didn't, it was never about seeking attention as I've been accused and trying to profit from this. I really was just trying to improve circumstances in life for people. And I know that I'm doing the right thing because I see the suffering every day not just with the people that matter to me and the people I live with, but while I was on campus, you can see their dismay. Uh, they're discouraged. They're disheartened. They're dissatisfied. They're depressed. And I'm so surprised that in a country like Canada, that we valued math and created safe spaces that we don't even acknowledge the mental health epidemic going on right now. And we've all endured it. That first lockdown was the worst for me. But uh, that should have been an indication that we should never have tolerated those kind of measures ever again. But we have, and people have bargained, and they've reconciled themselves and contented themselves with this new kind of life. And I would ask Canadians and people at large to ask more, ask more of life and for themselves and for the people that matter to them. Uh, those are the only kinds of people that are going to matter in the future it's not going to be the kinds of people that want to restrict freedoms and destroy the culture and society that so many have lived and died for so what you're envisioning is sort of a world that is much much worse than what we were say back in 2018 2019 if we stay on this trajectory um there's a group of people however big you want to say they are that envision if we just mask a little more, just vaccinate a little more, just lock down a little more, that will be our way out of this. Um, but the way we're envisioning it is it's just taking us further and further and further away from that normal. So how could you decouple that thinking for that group of people that they're 
um, set on thinking that more masks, more lockdown, more vaccination is the way out. And that's why they're so stuck on you to wear your mask or this or that. But what we're saying is getting rid of all of that is the way out of this. So what would you say um, to that group of people? Um, mm -hmm. I guess is my question. Okay. To the people that think that we're on the verge of um, emerging from this crisis, to the people that think that if we just continue and concede and give in uh, just a little longer, give them another inch of our freedoms, then we could go back to normal. Um, I would just ask those kinds of people to follow their logic to their conclusion. Uh, we're in the second year of this, which means we've gone through a full cycle of this and people should be prepared for what they can expect this year and the next if we carry on our path. And nobody, nobody on our side or on the opposition wants this pandemic to continue. And they especially don't want these mandates to continue. But uh, on our current trajectory, the government is going to admit that like, we don't have a handle on the situation and we're not giving you back your freedoms. And they're going to have to propose new options. <laughs> and we already know what those options are. And perhaps we need to ask everyone to make those decisions right now before we reach a point where they've made taken so much from us and radicalized and stoked the flames of internal divisions. And before the rhetoric became, becomes very divisive, we should ask everyone to decide right now how far they're willing to go to emerge from this pandemic. Because if we're in the same position we are this time next year, where they announce a new variant at a very opportune time, there's a new health measure, and life is going to be more or less the same for people like me. But it's going to be people that jump through these hurdles and hoops to get a semblance of their former lives back. And they're just nowhere near, near to attaining it. And they may realize that doing the same thing is not going to help anymore. And once you follow your own logic to a conclusion, you decide, are you going to take that extreme step and punish people that don't follow the mandates even more so than we already have? And you can look not too far back in history to know where those kinds of lines of argument lead to. Or you could realize and admit culpability on your own part for perpetuating this narrative. Because ultimately, if you believe you're in a pandemic, I implore you to step outside and look for the piles of bodies, look for the sick all around you go into the hospitals and see how many people are sick and lying in critical condition, clogging up the hallways, go and look, go and see how bad the pandemic is. And then when you can't find those examples of a crisis that people are led to believe we're living in, go out to the restaurants and see people eating and dining and only wearing masks between the uh, the trips to the restroom or entering, exiting the restaurant, the hundreds of people that are still out to grocery shop, hundreds of people that still commute to and from work every day. Does this really look like a pandemic to you? Uh, and just be honest. Let's just be honest about it from now on. And when you, you can watch a good movie or two and see what a real pandemic looks like and you realize this is not uh, a real pandemic anymore especially when uh, measures in the states are conceding that they can't afford to pay people to be sick and they can't afford people uh, that are laid off. Nobody talks about CERB anymore or uh, paying for students that can't find work because of these lockdowns. We don't talk about providing financial incentives or amenities for people uh, that continue to suffer and be excluded from society. Uh, or from the few privileges they're allowed to enjoy because of this pandemic, because they don't have to provide anything anymore. They've taken everything away instead. And um, instead of Canadians asking for the things that they used to enjoy, they should 
they should really be demanding the things that they had and were taken away. And being honest about this pandemic took more than just lives. It, it took our freedom and our liberty and our culture. Gone are the days where you can trust your neighbors and families and friends have turned on each other. What happened to, you know, dialogue and empathy and sympathy and honesty and all those sorts of things family and friends used to value. I've lost a lot of my friends and I've made a lot of more friends, but uh, isolating ourselves into our camps uh, could lead us to be very vulnerable going forward because uh, if this rhetoric of us and them is allowed to continue and perpetuate and be espoused by people with the highest offices in our land without, uh, without, without acknowledgement, without reprimand, it, it, it's just appalling. And I have sympathy for people that are going to suffer the most because of this, but it's everyone that's going to suffer because of that. It's not just going to be unvaccinated that potentially, as we've seen in other democracies and Commonwealth nations that are removed from their homes, are dragged off the side of the street and thrown into the back of a van, fired off to who knows where, uh, and put in these camps where they're still police. Um, they are going to suffer for sure. But everyone else that thinks they can enjoy their freedoms will be suffering as well because they will still be expected to mask even after taking whatever vaccine is necessary or supplement is necessary. And Canadians have lost that fight. Maybe we lost that fight years ago, decades ago. Canada is not a country known for its uh, independence, its revolutionary ideals, and its uh, militaristic contributions when there were real crises. And if we are the kind of culture that doesn't fight, uh, for those things that we used to cherish and uphold, then uh, don't be surprised when there is very little left to cherish and uphold apart from your job that you're permitted to go to. And that may just be about it, unfortunately, because you're, you're not allowed to enjoy your holidays. You're not allowed to go to communal or family gatherings or see your friends unless it's without the government's permission. But people should realize that they used to have those freedoms a few years ago. And we gave them up under the pretense of a crisis. And people think they should have to ask for those things back. But practically speaking, they can't even enforce it. And I go wherever I want. Uh, and I don't really feel like I'm living in a pandemic. I feel like I'm living in a cultural upheaval. Uh, an identity crisis in this country when uh, I get dirty looks walking down uh, the grocery aisle or in the mall or the few places I'm permitted to go to. But I am happy and content in life. And I would ask everyone else to ask themselves the same thing. So if there's one message or piece of advice to share with our listeners um, before we let you go, what would that be? To your students, uh, to your faculty, and everyone on your platform, I would just ask them to return to the things that made Western democracy so great to begin with, which was independence, dialogue, free thinking, courage, honesty, all those virtues we used to value. There are very few examples left in the world where we still see those things. And the only thing that is credible is the human spirit right now, at least. And uh, everyone has that still. As powerless as I feel, as powerless as everyone else that loses their um, placements, loses their employment, loses their education, uh, ultimately what you have is your ability to think freely and speak freely. And that should be what matters to most for everyone. And that is our greatest weapon in this fight. And for now, we can still wield it. So uh, my message to you is um, bridge that gap, bridge that divide, because 
it's not the opposition that wants to reconcile because they have a next step for people that they believe they can't reconcile with that are so misplaced, so undesirable, such a detriment to society that they will take extreme measures to uh, isolate and eliminate them potentially. They have a, a course of action if we can't bridge that divide. So really, perhaps the onus is on people like us, people that are listening, and we will be remembered fondly for it if we succeed. It will pay back in dividends enormously if we can be the generation that's remembered as the people that uh, started this cultural and spiritual awakening. And the questions need to be simple. I love my culture and history, but just ask the simple questions, which is, you know, if you're fully vaccinated, whether that's double or triple boosted at this point, um, why do you still feel compelled to wear a mask? And once I hear a well thought out and logical answer to that question, then we'll have dialogue. But people don't have, or at least from what I've seen on the opposition, they don't have a substantive answer to that question. And there's lots of questions like that. But maybe we don't even need to be talking about the pandemic anymore. Maybe we should just talk about uh, the personal things that have been lost throughout all of this. And the things that we thought we lost, ask ourselves, how much have we suffered and lost just because of this virus? How many people do you know uh, that have died of illness related to this virus? Because I still don't know anyone, uh, sadly, and I'm not, well, happily, let me correct myself, I suppose, but I don't know anyone that's died because of this virus. but. I know a lot of people that have suffered because of these mandates and people should be drawing a line in the sand right now. They should have drawn it two years ago, but it's never too late. And uh, people that want to listen should draw that line in the sand right now. Maybe they should write on a letter in an envelope and put it somewhere because people's thinking has changed since two years ago. And let's have dialogue about that because People should make decisions now before we're compelled to make them in the future. Compel them to draw a line and say, I'm not going to get a fourth booster because we're not talking about a fourth booster yet, but perhaps they will. And ask yourself right now, are you going to take a fourth booster if they ask you to? Are you going to put yourself into isolation and lockdown, even if you're fully protected from this virus? Are you going to stand by and let former friends and colleagues be carted off to camps for not abiding by these mandates. I want answers to those questions right now before that becomes a reality. And I think that's something your listeners should take away. That was perfect. Thank you so much for taking the time to sit down and, and have this discussion with us. We really appreciate it. No problem. Thank you for having me. Um, that was a long one. I haven't <laughs> done one in a while either. Like, uh, Christmas was a turbulent period, not just because I got ill like most people I know, but uh, just dealing with my legal case and uh, it's exhausting uh, networking and interviewing and like as much as I preach it, uh, uh, it is exhausting having dialogue even with the most stubborn and arrogant people, but we have to do it because that is the only thing we are permitted to do still. So thank you for uh, putting me back in the saddle. It's a great warm up for, uh, uh, if you haven't heard, I've been invited to speak at Victoria Park here in London on the 22nd at the Freedom Rally. So I'll be speaking to a lot of people then and I'll hopefully have a much more refined message for them for the five to 10 minutes that I have to get my point across and to give direction to a lot of people. That's awesome. I completely understand it. It can be very exhausting. All of this, like, it feels good to speak truth, but at the same time, it can be very tiring focusing on this all the time, being inundated with it. Um, so, yeah, we do really appreciate that. And best of luck to you uh, doing that speech. <laughs> it's going to mm -hmm. go really well.